Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, How to Win in B2B Digital Transformation, which is a joint webinar between Profit and INSEAD. Um, and I'm joined today by our two expert panelists. We've got Fred Geyer and Jörg Nissing joining me, Omar Achter, and uh, we'll just get into introductions in a, mi in a bit. Um, but just letting you know, we're going to go for about an hour with uh, 45 minutes of discussion and then 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, so as I said, my name is Omar Akhtar. I'm a senior analyst and research director at Altimeter, which is the research, research and advisory arm of Profit. Um, and what we do is we research digital transformation, uh, which is germane to today's topic. So we publish surveys, um, interviews with companies about best practices, key challenges, and we put them out in uh, quarterly reports throughout the year. And we've actually got our latest one coming out pretty soon, the State of Digital Transformation, which will come out sometime in July. And our two panelists today, uh, we've got Fred Geyer, who is a senior partner at Profit, one of the world's leading digital transformation consultancies. And his work focuses on helping B2B and B2BC, B2B2C clients in financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, and technology industries. Fred's passions include collecting antique maps of places he's been, rowing, and reading history on the porch of his main cottage, which is great, Fred. I didn't even know that. I should probably read your bio a lot more than I do now. And of course, we've also got Jörg Nissing, who is a professor of marketing at INSEAD, where he teaches executive education and MBA students. Jörg is the program director of INSEAD's flagship programs, um, B2B marketing strategies, and leading digital marketing strategy. Jorg's passions include playing with his two young boys, hiking in the mountains, and enjoying life in Paris. And of course, they're the co-authors of the newly published book, The Definitive Guide to Digital Transformation, which is available now on Amazon. And of course, you can also go to b2bdt.com, which I'm still shocked that you were able to get that URL. So uh, good on you for that. All right, so um, we'll spend our time today uh, going through the following points. We're going to start by talking about how B2B differs from B2C and why we chose specifically to focus on B2B uh, for, our, our, for our research and our an analysis. And then we're going to be looking at how to make that transformation actionable. What are the three key shifts or the foundational um, elements of a B2B digital marketing transformation? And then, as I mentioned, we'll reserve the last 15 minutes for Q&A. And the way that we're going to do that is if you can go down, you can see that Q&A button on the Zoom uh, taskbar down at the bottom. That's where we'll be looking at questions to answer. And this is going to be a fairly interactive webinar as well. So we're going to be doing um, a few polls, a few Q&As of our own. Um, so be on the lookout for a Menti link where you'll just have to input a code. It's really simple. Go and answer a few questions, which will really help make this um, webinar a bit more interactive and, and help us respond in real time to what we're seeing. Okay. And so, and, and just a reminder, the talk is going to be drawing very heavily on Fred and George's just released book. And we're gonna be giving you the details of that at the end of this. And uh, the, the other thing I would mention is uh, that everybody is gonna get a copy of the recording of this webinar. So if you've signed up via email, you're gonna get one in your inbox. And you can also go to the b2bdt.com um, website to get a copy of the webinar or replay it as you as, at your own time. So with that being said, Let's jump into our discussion today. And I think really the first formative question we want to figure out is, Fred, why do we decide to go after B2B as opposed to B2C, where so much of the sexiness is happening with digital transformation? Well, I think, um, you know, and I think actually B2B is becoming sexy, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I talk about, by the way, B2B, uh, I think we'll actually use the B2B and B2B to C because they're similar. Mm -hmm. um, but I think everybody's pretty aware uh, out there, I know the participants in this call, I'm sure, uh, that B2B and B2C are different. Uh, and then, and then really this difference boils down to um, really a multiplicity, just, a, 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 just an enormous uh, number of decision makers and influencers and agents uh, in both the buying and the deploying of, of services uh, and solutions and products. Um, but when you think about the implication of that, it should be that B2B is just rip-roaring um, historically on, on digital because nothing is better for addressing you know, multiple decision makers and all the different in, uh, people that we're talking about being involved in B2B uh, than digital. Um, but there's always been a barrier, um, two barriers in fact, um, data uh, and uh, access to the decision makers and influencers themselves. And those barriers have really over the last ooh, three to five years, they've come down enormously and we've seen a big surge in 
in B2B and B2B2C um, companies uh, undertaking uh, digital transformations. Uh, and, and really it's for two reasons. On the data side, what's happened is the cloud has allowed uh, companies to really just um, uh, remake their use of existing data, get rid of the silos, really get at their customer uh, data. Uh, and the, in B2B, there's just been new data services coming up, um, uh, it, it, you know, healthcare is a good example where there are all sorts of data services now available uh, with, with, with that, that, that really serve the industry. And then on the access side, we've seen two things. Uh, one, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the growth of just uh, channels to get at B2B decision makers that were never there before, uh, but also a willingness on their part uh, to be open to engaging digitally. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I'll call it traditionalists in B2B and B2B to C, uh, and they really changed. Now, COVID has, if anything, accelerated that. Uh, and, uh, and you see this just great opening. So what that really boils down to, and the reason why we did this work, is that uh, decision makers, uh, and particularly Jorg, and he's out with, uh, you know, his executive education classes, I'm with my clients, uh, they come to us and say, but tell us where to start. This is complex. I can't use the B2C models, uh, help us. And that's why we, 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 I'll call it, that's why B2C, B2B, excuse me. Yeah, in, in a way it's almost like um, the B2C side should be looking at the B2B models when it comes to digital, because it's, it's so much of the personalized approach and, and the data strategy that's centralized. I think there's, it really should be going the other way around, would you agree? I think that's right. In fact, this David Sanders on, uh, has, uh, has, has gotten this idea of that's actually P to P. And that's actually the key on B2B because you've got this kind of layer that is at the layer of the industry. Then there's a layer of at the company, but to really be effective, and this is what digital allows you to do, is to go to the layer of the person um, and get at the complexity of all the different people in the company. Thanks, Fred. So what we're going to do next, um, we're going to find out a few things in real time. And Jörg, I'm going to pass it over to you to set this up. Uh, but we want to conduct a real time poll to, to, to drive some of the discussion going forward. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Omar. And uh, yeah, before I dive into uh, the next topic here, uh, we want to do a quick poll with you guys. Uh, so the first one is, uh, is here on Zoom. Uh, let me quickly launch it here. It's a simple question uh, that we researched for our book. I mean, what do you think are the biggest barriers when it comes to successful uh, digital transformation? So I give you like 30 seconds uh, to, to answer this uh, and, then, and then we will talk about it. You can, as, uh, you can pick up to three and then we will dive into it. Perfect, so we almost at 70% of you have answered. And hopefully we didn't bias you uh, with uh, the outline uh, that we sent. So let's, let's take a look at the results here. Uh, so the winning one, interestingly, is uh, shifting the business model, uh, then followed closely uh, by the point Fred was making earlier, uh, using customer data, but also uh, realigning the deployment of technologies. Uh, before I um, talk a little bit about my research and, and jump into this, uh, I want to do one more uh, question here, which is on uh, Mentimeter, uh, which, uh, which is actually a little bit um, more complex. This is why we put this on Mentimeter. So please go to menti.com, very easy, and then um, a screen should pop up where you just type in the code that you see here, 7982. Three zero, and what I ask you to do is literally rate your organization's investment in transformation management. Like, really, how do you manage your transformation? This could be mindset, this could be skills, this could be talent, governance, and then I ask you to rate. Uh, secondly, the investments you're doing in technology-enabled initiatives. So, what? How much do you spend in? leveraging digital technology from augmented reality to robotics, you name it. 
So also here, maybe quickly uh, 30 seconds um, before we uh, talk a little bit about um, the results. <clears throat> So Jorg, there's a question here about, do we rate ourselves relative, relative to our peers or, or versus five years ago? <laughs> that's, that's a very good question here. Uh, uh, let, me, let me dive into this into a, into a second, because uh, this is a, let me present the results while the answers are, are coming in here from, uh, from a few people um, that you, that have already answered here. I mean, it looks like, uh, as you can imagine, the big bubble in the middle is the average, while the small bubbles, so that's, that's literally you as a, what you rated, and it's, it's all over, right? So uh, we see some of you are more in the top right, while some of you are more in the bottom left. Uh, so really, really good mix here. And um, I mean, the question uh, that uh, came up, Omar, it's a very important one, because we will talk about this later. When you think about digital transformation, I mean, you think about what's relevant for your organization in your industry, instead of just saying, okay, Google, I give it a 10, right? So, and I benchmark myself uh, against Google. So that's, uh, I will talk about this later uh, when we dive into a couple of cases. Um, but what's interesting here, um, and uh, I do this research at INSEAD, but the original uh, study is done by um, Cap Gemini in, in collaboration with the MIT. And um, what they have researched is um, they, they put these companies uh, into a two by two. If you are really doing good on both, I mean, we saw roughly 25% of our audience is in this box in the top right, meaning a digital expert, um, then you are a digital expert. Uh, if you put yourself in the bottom left, rating uh, both dimensions low, of course you are a beginner. And at the end of the day, uh, back to the question, Omar, I mean, compared to your um, competitive market, um, uh, ideally you uh, want to be in the digital expert box because what they have realized in that research is um, that the revenues are up 10%, the profitability is up 26%, and the valuation is up 12%. But the key question, and that's where I uh, continued the research, is really, um, do you, are you better off being a fashionista or are you better off being a conservative? And mm -hmm. what we see in, in my uh, classes, what also was a result in uh, the um, MIT study uh, a couple of years back, is that as a beginner, your market valuation is minus 7%. So long story short, do not stand still. But then interestingly, if you are a fashionista, your market valuation is minus 12, while if you are conservative, your market valuation is plus seven, right? And here we have to keep in mind the companies that got researched were um, corporates incumbents, right? Um, of course, if you are a startup, uh, you have a different approach. But as we all know, the key difference is you're not burning your own money, you are burning VC money, right? So yeah. of course you wanna be a fashionista. But how I summarize that study really is, it's better when it comes to digital transformation to walk in the right direction than mm -hmm. running in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. If you know how to run in the right direction, of course run. But if you, what we realized in our research again, most incumbents, and that goes back to change in mindset, change in culture, we will talk about enablers later, they really struggle with this. Right, so, and uh, if I again go to um, the results here from, uh, from the first uh, poll, uh, which you should see by now again, hopefully, um, it's very interesting, right? So what we also saw here, um, the point understanding what customers really need and want, which now is also 42% as a reason why digital transformations uh, often fail, that's what we realized is really the key barrier, right? I completely understand this shifting the business model, 65%, or realigning the deployment of technologies, what people say, uh, 36%. But I'm always saying, if you do not really know how you want to leverage technology, if you don't know what customers really expect, you are running in the wrong direction, right? And yeah. You just follow the buzzwords, oh, I have to uh, business model innovation, I have to update my business model, but you don't know for what you do it, 
for what you're doing it for, you have a problem. Uh, to that point, Jörg, do you see, um, you know, in our research, we found that CIOs are still really being tasked with a lot of digital transformation programs at companies. And do you think that that's a, an approach that's being phased out or it's becoming less and less relevant? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, if you think about it, right, that's exactly mm -hmm. this technology first, right? Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's, again, don't get me wrong, it's absolutely important, right? We talk about technology every day, but also Fred and I, in our book, we try to make this book technology agnostic, right? Because at mm -hmm. the end, again, you need to understand where, where is my industry going? What are my competitors doing? But even more mm -hmm. important, what do my customers really want? And then how can I leverage the technology to create right. You know, experiences or business models. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So based on that, um, what are some of the key factors of success now that you've figured out that, okay, this is the way that we're going to go. And this is, um, if we're not going to go with a technological approach, um, what do we need to do when it comes to going from the outside in? That's a question for, for Fred or myself. Yeah, skip, I want you to skip on, uh, uh, Omar, <laughs> to two slides. Mm -hmm. uh, there you go, keep, yeah, keep mm -hmm. going. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so right here. Um, so what we found is, um, you know, it, it's easy to say this in, 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 um, in principle. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. we need to be customer-centric. Of course, we need to be thinking about our employees and how to make them customer-centric. Of course, we need to be thinking about using customer data. But how do you make that uh, successful and, and how do you turn that into action? Uh, and what we've seen, we've looked at a lot of, of, of companies um, uh, through a case method, both successful and an unsuccessful. And we've been able to boil down uh, four key steps uh, that they need to undertake, uh, no matter what the nature of the transformation. And Jorg is gonna talk about different types of transformations in just a second. Uh, but the first one is what we call where to play. Uh, and that is about really taking the time up front to understand the customer opportunities, to get in the mind of the customer, uh, and to find out where there's a match between what the customer needs and what you can provide. Uh, the second is um, how to win. And that's about building strategies that match up um, with the customer. Instead of trying to be best in class, uh, or even sometimes best in category. Um, it's those that really tailor strategies that, that really fit those customer needs and get on a process of need fulfillment, uh, leading to results, leading to more ability to invest, leading to going back to need fulfillment again. Um, now, now the other part of that is though, uh, very few companies, uh, you know, actually I should say, only the most sophisticated digital companies um, really have, I'm gonna call it what it takes to make this happen. They often have to put in place a lot of things, we call it what to do. And of course, it's impossible to map out all of the things to do, uh, but, but it is important to see, to get to the essentials of, of is there a key thrust that we need to undertake? Uh, we see, for instance, that there's a common pattern of needing to uh, enable, um, in, for instance, in digital marketing, um, agile sprint teams, uh, mm -hmm. and to get them on specific types of sprints uh, that will really show um, uh, real impact. Um, and, and for instance, that's a key thrust. Uh, there'll be different key thrusts for different types of, 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 of uh, transformations. Um, and, um, and this is where um, people and technology come together uh, to make things happen. And then the last one, and probably um, one of the ones that unfortunately gets overlooked the most, is the, the thinking through who to win with. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of research out there that really says that enabling employees is both one of the keys to success, but also one of the things that gets overlooked uh, as mm -hmm. in this, I'll call it technology first um, um, a kind of approach. And, what, and, and when we think about, once again, the who, and we'll talk about this a little later at the end of the, the, uh, the webinar, uh, we could think about that in a lot of dimensions, but, but it's such a big topic that, that you've got to really focus at the beginning on what's really key. You know, when we say who to win with, what is the group of people that you can get this momentum going 
uh, and that the company can build off of, get results uh, and build off of. And, and so where to play, how to win, what to do, who to win with, these are the steps that we see as common ingredients among successful um, transformers. Yeah. So before we go to the next uh, step, I'm curious, Fred, you know, we saw in the poll that everybody talked about the idea of having to change their business model of being the biggest barrier. And do you think, um, how would you relate these four key steps to changing a business model, which is yeah. something that's so entirely difficult? Yeah. Well, no, it's interesting because um, I, I would say that, 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 that they are really important. Uh, so I would mm -hmm. say that, that the business model change, and we actually uh, address that, York's going to address that in, in a section about in the mm -hmm. area of uh, business, um, um, changing your, your proposition or pivoting. Your right. Career. It's one of the biggest transformations, uh, mm -hmm. not the only one, um, mm -hmm. but in doing it, um, this understanding the customer and having a clear strategy is really important. Uh, but business model uh, change is so big uh, that, that if you don't bring along the who and the what, uh, it will fail. Uh, you know, you could have a great opportunity uh, and have a great strategy, but it is that classic. Um, you know, Bill Butler also in the, in the Q&A uh, talks about this idea of the rapid sprint. Uh, and um, I can't say that that is crucial for all uh, transformations, uh, but I can say that the pattern we've seen is it's a very frequent um, uh, ingredient. Um, and, and, be, and the reason for it is that um, companies need to get these wins to get, uh, to get momentum building uh, in a step-by-step -step approach, but they also need to be able to fail. Uh, and, uh, and so the test and learn process really depends on doing that quickly. If you have to wait six months or nine months to win or fail, uh, man, you're in trouble from be before it even starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It really drives home the point that transformation is is such a uh, almost a, a misnomer since it is really a series of tiny cuts that happen over a period of time that cause it to happen rather than a monolithic overhaul of something. That's right, and doing it fast is hard. Yeah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I work with a lot of insurance companies, and going fast is hard. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay, based on that, uh, Yor, can you talk us through, you know, in the book you mentioned transformational shifts, which is this idea of um, framing the way that you put your effort and, and time into changing things. So what are the three transformational shifts that you've decided are the building blocks of a B2B digital transformation? Yeah, so exactly. We wanted to structure this, this four W's, if you will, uh, in, in a better way. And that's also mm -hmm. linked to the question here I'm seeing from uh, Gianluca in the, in the chat, right? So mm -hmm. where do I start as an organization? Right, and my answer usually is where it makes sense from a customer's perspective, right? And that's where we said, okay, some organizations they focus more on the digital selling shift, while others do the proposition pivot, and uh, the the last group is doing the experience makeover. So what are these? I mean, the first one, which we call the digital selling shift, is really about moving away from this classic and inefficient uh, model where B two B sales and marketing was uh, not integrated, right? Really, uh, I call it the clearing the warehouse approach, with what many B2B companies did. And again, back to Gianluca's point here, no segmentation. We didn't really look at what customers expect and we produced great products and marketing was there to clear the warehouse, full stop, mm -hmm. right? But now with all the technology and the trends that we have at hand, I mean, digital targeting, digital analytics, personalization, content creation, automated maybe, right? There's so much you can do. And it's really about how marketing is moving from this um, sales approach um, to being really the driving force in understanding customer value, where is the customer value, creating it, communicating it, delivering it, and monetizing it, right? So that's really the selling shift. We will dive deeper into this using a few examples. Mm -hmm. The second one, uh, the experience makeover. Yes, this one is really about how can I create outstanding uh, experiences by leveraging digital technologies, right? These can be more tailored experiences, dynamic. Uh, these could uh, focus on a, on a specific broken touch point or it could be an end-to-end -end experience. But again, it's the end of the day, you as an organization, you're still working or optimizing this experience for your existing products, solutions, and services. 
While then the last shift, I mean, as the name already said, is a proposition pivot. It's really about how can I move away from a, from a classic a product value proposition to a data powered uh, solution, uh, which is really creating potentially the additional revenue streams for an organization. I mean, this is, would be the high level summary of uh, the three shifts. And it's important to note here, um, and that's by how we wrote the book as well, um, as a company, you again decide where do you stand, uh, where do you have the, the, the most important needs, and then you pick the shift you want to focus on. And for most organizations, organizations, at least the ones I have at INSEAD, it is the selling shift or the customer experience makeover, while the more advanced organizations in B2B, they constantly think about new revenue streams um, applying the proposition pivot. But to that point, why do you think that is? So what is it about the digital selling shift that makes it such a, a ripe area for tackling first? Yeah, uh, and very simply, because it's, uh, if we can go to the next slide, uh, it's a great way to, uh, to generate demand um, to, uh, and generate demand uh, in, in all sorts of ways, uh, not just acquire uh, new customers, but uh, enable uh, 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 cultivation of existing customers, uh, help the sales force, uh, uh, and support them in their work, uh, help intermediaries in their work, at times even to bypass intermediaries. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's really one of the great transformations because it's one of the fastest ways to get to uh, bottom line results. Um, and when uh, we, we see uh, examples of companies doing this, and we intentionally in the book uh, picked out a, a real traditional uh, company, uh, Air Liquid. Uh, and Air Liquid, very you know, a, a classic company, deep relationships with uh, their largest customers um, that are face-to-face, -face, large selling teams, uh, but a much more transactional, um, touch point driven um, uh, a, a relationship with their um, small and medium enterprises. Uh, and the market, though, was moving in that direction. Uh, a lot of growth in the small and medium enterprises. Um, they acquired Air Gas. Uh, a company that was more advanced in digital marketing uh, to, uh, to undertake <clears throat> this digital selling shift. And as they did, one of the first things that they did um, is they, they first started looking into their customer profiles and use cases for those customers. Um, and, uh, and that's under the where to play. Um, and, and, and as they did that, looked at those customer use cases and profiles, what they saw is that the the, the, the small and medium enterprise really didn't want to have that much personal inter, inter, interaction. So just increasing the sales team, et cetera, wasn't going to be the solution. They were much more self-sufficient. They wanted to work on their own. They liked to use the internet to, to, to find things. So a proposition that was built around that, but still had the basics of, of rapid supply, rebought liability was important. So for them then, um, that was then how to make uh, a, a digital sales and marketing strategy. And we talk about there are four key, four C's that are important. And, and I must say the Air Liquid guys uh, executed this very simply, uh, but very well. Uh, the first one was clarifying the target. They had to move from saying small and medium enterprises to how do I get to Charlie or Susan or uh, Anthea at those companies so that I can target them. I know who to get after. And that was actually very possible using some new data sources in their industry. The second part of then of the, the, the next C is to um, um, capture their attention. And they did that through uh, a new initiative in social um, and to, to really kind of get, make these enterprises aware that there was an offering there that they could use. Uh, the third was to cultivate their interest. Um, br bringing to light a whole bunch of things about how they could be more efficient uh, and save time and money uh, in terms of working with uh, Air Liquide. And finally, uh, uh, converting them. Uh, and in their case, they had a whole strategy around using uh, the Internet of Things so that people could monitor where they were in terms of their, uh, their needs, essentially how filled up were their tanks, uh, and containers of, of the different um, um, supplies, and, and that would urge uh, them to take action. You know, on, on what to do, um, their key thing was uh, not so much agile sprints to get these things up and running, 
Uh, they were very rapid to do that, but a whole test and learn program where they'd sprint, try a different approach. Maybe it was a different type of communication. Maybe it was a different target, but doing that really fast uh, so that they get the answers, change it and go back to it. Now, a big part of this uh, and the who is, is needed for them was actually bringing over um, the folks from Air Gas and bringing them into the Air Liquid digital marketing team, which they set up uh, to accomplish this. Uh, and they got at creating a customer data and analytics team faster than normal because they were able uh, to use the, the acquisition to make that happen. Uh, I think what's interesting to look at over here is that um, there's so much coordination between uh, teams that may not have worked before. You've got a product team, you've got a, a, a you know people looking at the Internet of Things, and you've got the people that are figuring out the messaging, people are figuring out the so social. Is there anything we can learn from Air Liquid in terms of how they were able to get so many disparate functions on the same page with this is how we're going to transform our entire selling approach? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, actually, part of it is, that, that you is the step-by-step -step part is you, you marshal these teams, uh, cross-functional teams around very specific steps with very clear objectives. Um, and, and, and therefore what you're not trying to do is change, take the whole company and change it all at once, but you're trying to change, change a part of the company uh, rather quickly. Uh, and then the minute you can solidify that, that, uh, that learning, you move and you expand, you expand. Mm -hmm. uh, now that takes a different form of management because you have to, on the one hand, set a vision, but you really have to empower, especially mid-manager level uh, uh, employees mm -hmm. to be able to take the, 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 the um, uh, to take these steps. Uh, you can't like, I'll call it start at the top and let it ripple all the way down. You've got to start at the top, but then be very actionable. Uh, I'll call it at the, roll up your sleeves level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that, that same sort of um, thinking or, or getting everybody on board apply to the, uh, the, the digital experience makeover, Jorg? Yeah, so absolutely. Let's, let's move to the next case here that we also work closely with uh, for the book, which is Neask, uh, which I think is a, it's a fantastic uh, company. I mean, here going back to, uh, I think what's, before we move into uh, who is needed, but um, going back to what I, what I said earlier, I think what's important, many companies focus on this experience makeover, mm -hmm. but uh, they, they just do a semi-good job, right? And they don't mm -hmm. really remove pain, point and pain points, and here it's really about removing the pain points um, by, by literally um, leveraging digital technologies uh, instead of just transposing a medical uh, analog interaction into an equally mm -hmm. named digital experience. Right, and I think Nersk uh, that was a very interesting example. Um, and by the way, also back to the question uh, earlier about the, the Mentimeter, the two by two. I remember mm -hmm. the the head uh, of, I mean, currently the head of uh, the digital experience at Nersk, who was in one of my classes where I actually did uh, the same exercise. Here, if I go back to the two by two, I remember uh, he put himself uh, into uh, the top right, right, and then I asked uh, students. Um, uh, who, who is putting yourself in the top right here as a digital expert? And um, he, uh, he raised his hand and he said, okay, which company do you work for? And then he said, like, Miask, right? And everybody was like laughing. You mean this uh, container shipping company, digital transformation at a container shipping company? It can't be more boring, right? But then he said, hey, you know what? I mean, let me tell you a little bit what we have been through uh, over the last years. And here, exactly to the point earlier, should I rate myself to my competitors or should I rate myself uh, to, to other companies? Um, they started with small steps, right? And back to the segmentation, back to analyzing what customers really want, decomposing uh, the entire journey. Because at that time, Maersk literally had no history of being customer centric. And uh, because the industry got more commoditized, that was a problem in terms of differentiation, right? So they really said, okay, how can we make a difference? Let's analyze um, the experience, let's, let's map the journey, and then let's really understand how we uh, can use uh, digital trends uh, to optimize it. Because um, senior executives at Maersk were also always saying, I mean, customer interactions are just a gold mine, right? You're getting so much data out of it um, that you can leverage. 
And that's what they have realized. So they started with this robust research. They actually looked into almost 10 different segments. So also here again, experiences differ, right? So they had an experience for each of the segments. They started with the quick wins. I mean, that's also going back to the discussions around uh, sprints we had earlier. I mean, some use cases, where can you have small successes that again help to convince uh, people in the organization to do more, to, to invest more in it, right? So, and um, at the beginning, it was like simple things, like they had lots of, I mean, going back to the pain points, uh, simple things like invoicing was a huge problem at Maersk, right? Paper-based invoices sent to the wrong address, right? So simple things like this. Then uh, customer communication through digital channels, um, content uh, creation through digital ch channels. So that's where they started. But today, I mean, as maybe some of you uh, who have followed uh, this industry, I mean, they added quite a few things. So it's, it's uh, creating customer value by better term terminal utilization at harbors, if you will, self-service instant container booking. So you can just literally go to the website, book a container, and you get a, a cargo load guarantee, right? And again, in this industry, uh, overbooking rates of, of 30% was quite normal, right? So here you see they started small, um, was really fixing the pain points where uh, you also cannot really delight customers because they expect it, right? But then um, at, a, at a later stage, they really delighted customers uh, by, by really adding additional value uh, that customers didn't expect. And I mean, also here, uh, if I think about the what to do, I mean, I talked a little bit about the rapid prototyping and piloting, but also even more important, who is needed. I mean, that is very complex in, in an experience makeover, right? We, I mean, uh, we map in my classes, we map the experience, right? We look into what are the touch points, what are the pain points and what to focus on. But at the end, I mean, you need designers to conceive them, you need engineers to build them, uh, you need uh, user experience experts and interface experts uh, to construct the interfaces of, of mm -hmm. all these digital bookings, right? So you see the, the people needed here, that was also a, a quite complex uh, exercise. But at the end, to, to sum it up, I mean, this experience makeover was then going forward for me as really this one point of differentiation um, against their competitors. Yeah. I'm, I'm not surprised in the least to see Marisk on this list. Um, they've been doing really innovative things for a long time and, and, and they've been courting customers who will never buy from them at all. If you look at their Instagram accounts or social media accounts, they're a classic example of b 2 b to c where they're doing really amazing, engaging work uh, with the general public as well as their own owned experiences. Yeah, okay. and by the way, Omar, that's a very good point. I mean, you, we could have used Maersk for the digital mm -hmm. selling shift as well, because to your point, mm -hmm. as a container shipping com company, it's just amazing what they do on social media. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then, Fred, finally, can you take us through the digital proposition shift? Yeah, this is probably the biggest one, and, and, um, and the one that tends to, uh, I'll call it, turn companies upside down, uh, but also for incumbents, one um, that can you know, lead to just phenomenal results. One of the once we talk about, we're going to talk about Michelin fleet solutions right now, but one of the most famous ones actually several years ago was when Adobe uh, undertook the shift to move from, um, a call, let's call box or prepackaged software uh, over to selling software as a service. Uh, and and that, that, that led to a tidal wave of companies uh, undertaking a, a pivot, essentially taking their core offering and thinking about it um, in just a, a totally new way. Um, now, when we think about that, and we're going to walk through Michelin as we go through this, uh, the key step once again here is this customer understanding. Uh, but it has to go now beyond just segmentation in understanding where they are, uh, but thinking about where they could be. The idea of uh, growth territories. Uh, there's a kind of a, for hockey lovers, there, one of our colleagues, Charlene, who speaks a lot about uh, leadership and change, talks about Wayne Gretzky and skating, not to where the puck is, but to where the puck's going to be. Uh, and, and this is the key here. Uh, and for Michelin, uh, it was really interesting. Um, they, are, they make high performance uh, tires uh, for fleets, um, one of the best. But they increasingly saw that 
that competing, as they really got into understanding customers, that competing based on performance doesn't really get to the issue, the heart of the issue uh, of productivity, fuel efficiency, uh, wear and tear on tires, because maintenance is actually a more important factor um, for all of those things than the performance of the tire itself. Or another way to put it is, a high performance tire will only help you if it's well maintained. And there's a lot to that maintenance. Uh, and that led them to see an opportunity. Uh, let's call it the software as a service of tires, um, where the opportunity was to say, let's charge people not to buy tires, but let's uh, charge them by the kilometers that their tires actually run. Uh, the, and I say people, uh, fleet operators. Yeah. But to think that through required really thinking about the, 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 uh, the whole proposition. Uh, and this is where it gets really interesting. Often the core idea or the core innovation happens in a company. They, they say, I know how to do this. Uh, for instance, they said, hey, I, I can create sensor technology built into tires that can see how far they're going. But the rest of the company needs to come with it. Um, and that was the real key here is to actually think about what would be the services in terms of maintenance facilities? What would you need to do with IoT and databases? Well, uh, and they created uh, a whole new customer uh, um, data sharing uh, database that something like 50,000 customers participated in or joined up for within only six months. They, um, they had to think about um, the uh, uh, billing and, um, and how to shift from selling tires where you get all the money up front to moving to getting your revenues over a period of time. Um, and, they, and they had to work that all the through, what we call a data powered market proposition uh, because that proposition kept evolving. Uh, when they first started in the first year or so, um, their P&Ls weren't where they wanted them to be. They had to test and learn their way by uh, offering new more and more services over time. And that's where the growth moves and the growth roadmaps uh, happen, is taking it step by step. You know, they had one program which was called Effetires, which is about this data sharing and just helping you become more efficient. Uh, there was another one which was about Fuel, which is really going and taking the fuel savings to a much higher level. Other programs for specific industries where they set up their own maintenance facilities where, where they would actually take over a fleet's uh, maintenance uh, and they would do all the pressure and the tire rotation and the, and the inspection, et cetera. Now, um, interesting for them, that led to a need to just think about transformation management in a whole way. And by the way, this transformation management office or group of people is key. But for them, the task was so big, they actually set up an entirely new business unit, uh, a fleet solutions business unit uh, that was empowered to make this shift. Now, it's interesting, this shift has been just fantastic for them, but you can see how it is quite big. And one of the, uh, we're gonna talk about this in the question and answer, this idea of like, which shifts do you take at the beginning, at the end, et cetera, because this shift included aspects of the digital selling shift and the digital experience makeover as well as the, the proposition itself. That's fascinating to, to hear the story, the Michelin story, you know, a tire company uh, really doing so much more than not just selling tires. Um, so we're just coming up on, on time for our Q&A. I know we wanted to talk about um, organization as well as uh, people that are uh, crucial to this, but I think we've got a few really good questions coming in. I think the first one comes in from Rory Sales saying, do you tend to find companies focus on more than one of the transformational shifts at one time? And what are the benefits or risks of trying multiple at once? And I think uh, this really is, is, a, is a big one. Um, when you've got three shifts um, and the first instinct is, well, we've got to kind of do all of them. Um, or which one do you do first or do you do them in parallel? How do you, what's that thought process that you would give to companies? Yeah, I mean, sure. here it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, what Fred said, the digital proposition pivot, if you do that one, like in the Michelin case, you most likely do the other one, the other two as well. But by the way, in the Michelin case, it took them 10 years to make every contract profitable, right? Mm -hmm. So um, just if you think about it, the complexity, they underestimated what it takes, right? 
um, uh, if you think about invoicing, if you think about understanding how much do I charge, I mean, there are different trucks, there are different uh, things you transport, right? So it all influences the price. But here, I mean, that's, if you do that one, you most likely do the other ones as well. But uh, linked to the selling shift and the experience makeover, I mean, here again, what I see at INSEAD, but I don't know what it is for you at Profit, but uh, it's, it's more or less 50-50, right? So many B2B companies, uh, they still really struggle with what B2C companies might say is a straightforward shift, right? I sell digital and engage more effectively digitally. Um, but in B2B companies, um, I, I see 50% of the companies still focusing on that shift while the other half is focusing on the experience makeover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And actually, I'm going to pick up because there's another question from Gianluca uh, that actually gets right to this. Um, the, this idea of verticals and, and like a, where do companies stand? Uh, so first of all, I would say that it, it varies very much by industry vertical. Um, so um, for instance, I deal a lot with um, commercial insurance companies. Uh, and for these companies, I think there is a great emphasis um, on uh, the experience. Um, a lot of, uh, call it, uh, um, essentially, um, um, work that's done by either sales forces, intermediaries, uh, underwriters, and, and uh, claims professionals uh, that is very uh, people intensive. Uh, and in this uh, area, we see a real big move uh, toward uh, uh, working on, for instance, claims experiences to make them faster, more reliable by automating them. Um, there are some other areas, and I would say um, uh, almost all of the areas where there is a large sales force involved or a large number of intermediaries involved, we're seeing a big move to the digital selling shift. Now, with COVID, that has super accelerated. The companies that we're already doing are doubling down, and then other companies that were just way too afraid to ever uh, get into that because it might cause channel conflict, might alienate their own sales force, et cetera, have said, I have to do it. I, I, I just have to. Uh, and, they're, and, and they're investing in it a lot. And that, 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 so that, that tends to be not so much industry specific, but really uh, for companies that have big sales teams or a lot of intermediaries. Uh, then in the, in the healthcare area, uh, we're seeing it um, very much divided. Um, on the medical device uh, area, we're seeing, for instance, that both experience shifts, uh, actually all three, to be honest, while in marketing to physicians, uh, I should say, in working with physicians, uh, much more of the emphasis is on uh, digital marketing to physicians, uh, moving away from the traditional sales, sales team. Now, is what B2B uh, uh, used uh, is right on. Now, one of the issues is that B2B companies aren't very transparent. Uh, and when they get going on these, America is a good example. Uh, they let people in their industry know, but you know, a lot of people don't follow these industries. So even when they are transparent, it's hard to know kind of what they're doing. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we set up the site that we did, b2bdigitaltransformation.com, b2bdt.com. Uh, and used, uh, one of the things you can do is we've got a bunch of, an area, a research area, where you can go and look at cases uh, that may help you. Um, uh, is there a typical? I would say there is, um, it's a really a range. Um, I think a, a few years ago, because of those barriers, barriers around data uh, and access, uh, you would say that most B2B companies were beginners, uh, but I think that's no longer the case. There's a full range of companies who both very successfully uh, uh, undertaken transformations uh, and others that are still starting out. No, and I'm, um, maybe here, just, uh, just continue, Uma, on the questions, maybe. Uh, great question from, from David here. Um, my quick background, as people that know me know, is very quantitative. Uh, so uh, I like these questions around data. But David, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, there's so much potential when it comes to uh, leveraging uh, data in B2B, in particular social media data, right? So um, just to give you an example, early Keat. Um, when Air Liquid um, was uh, acquiring air gas and uh, they just looked into uh, social media listening data and Google search data. Um, and what they realized is that uh, in, in, uh, in the US, if people, customers are searching, 
for 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 gas, if you will, like the, the pizza guy next door, um, uh, next door, they are searching for air bottle. But then in the UK, people were searching for air cylinder, right? When they acquired um, air gas, they used on their website in the UK air bottle, air bottle, air bottle all the time because that's what they were used uh, from, from the US, right? And then they realized uh, leveraging Google Trends and, and uh, social media listening data, hey, we should change it on our website in the UK from air bottle to air cylinder, right? And by just doing this change, sales increased by 15%. Right, so you see, I mean, this is, I mean, I can, I can have, uh, I can look into Google Trends, get this information in five minutes, and I increase my sales in the UK by fifteen percent. Right, so you see, I, I, companies just don't leverage it. Yeah, you're, wouldn't you also say though? I think there's a real difference uh, be from B 2 C uh, to B 2 B in the use of social, um, and that is the typical, I'll call it a B 2 C approach. Uh, is to get after the big platforms and try to exploit them. Uh, but B2B, um, those platforms obviously are not really set up for B2B conversations. Uh, and in B2B, it's really finding uh, platforms and conversations that work, whether those are industry platforms or whether they're advocacy platforms or whether they're, or they're, whether they're creating uh, user groups and building your own uh, platforms, typically not company-based, but around common issues. Um, and this is a real key difference um, about um, being more tailored to the industry and to the conversations, because in B2B, you have, kind of, you have to go find where the conversation is happening, because it just doesn't happen in the big places. Now, the other part of that is that sometimes the conversation is also gated. You know, Sermo is a real good example in healthcare. Uh, where there is a, a where physician uh, conversations happen, but it's a gated community, and you need to earn your way into being able to provide things that are valuable to that gated uh, community to participate in as a supplier. Agreed. Great. I mean, I yeah, I could maybe jump on the next one here, Xavier. Uh, very nice uh, question as well, which we which we jumped over more or less, right? You, the expensive legacy systems. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, Fred and I are marketeers. We look at uh, digital transformation from a marketing perspective, customer-centric perspective, but we jumped over uh, this slide, a uh, human-centered organization transformation, right? And uh, Xavier, your, your question is really also linked to this. I mean, to make, and Fred and I discussed this a lot, should we actually, uh, tackle this in our book because there are entire books just talking about this, right? But we also felt a book without talking about the enablers would feel uh, not complete. And I mean, legacy systems is of course a huge uh, problem, right? So to get your digital transformation strategy right, you have to think about the soul, the body, and the mind, um, if you will. Um, which uh, body we describe as the, the organization, the roles, the tools, the systems you're using. Um, and that's where the legacy systems fall in. The mind, right? Do you apply the right mindset? Do you have a rat management approach, an entrepreneurial approach? Do you allow uh, your teams uh, taking risks, right? Test and learn. I mean, again, we, we jumped a little bit over this, but it's a very critical point. And uh, these organizational enablers are the other key reason, back to our question at the beginning of the webinar, why most digital transformations fail. Yeah, and Jörg, if you go to the next uh, slide, um, uh, very specifically to, to, to have your um, uh, point, um, the, there's a real difference um, that's, a, I'm going to call it a digital difference, between understanding um, customer attitudes and feelings, um, including um, things like NPS, um, which are very useful, um, but they're only part of the picture. Um, and for NPS is a real good example. It only tells you how people feel after it happened, right? And getting to a, a, a real time, and, and this is where I must say in telecom, um, I've seen actually some real great moves. Uh, data's always been there, but legacy systems got in the way, and, uh, and the telecom store 
uh, has always been a barrier uh, to getting that connection. Uh, but they're overcoming it and moving to a more real-time world where you can get at what are people doing, the behavioral, uh, matching it up with the, who they are, the profiling, and then getting at the perceptual data, how, like NPS, what do they think about that? Uh, and, and, and so um, I think that the answer is, yeah, we are seeing. But the key thing here is to move away uh, from these things that tell you what happened after the fact uh, and get going on the things that are telling you what's happening in the experience or during the selling um, uh, uh, path um, uh, or, for instance, in pricing during the proposition pivot. Uh, and by the way, you don't have to fill in every box. It's about starting with the use cases, saying what do you need the most, getting after that data, um, and kind of working your way through. Uh, thank you, Fred. With an eye on time, I think we probably got a chance for one more question. And I think this is, I'd like to combine um, the questions from Rory Brownlee and Shamashita because I think they're so um, similar, which is when you look at your transformational shifts, how should we be thinking about um, the time to return? And what is the, uh, what is the benchmark for success? Is it X revenue or is it um, NPS scores? How should we be thinking about putting a, a, a scorecard in our efforts? Yeah, You're going, can I take that one? No, yep, please go ahead. So, um, I, I'm very much of the opinion and have always been that ROI um, needs to be treated in these, um, I'll call it customer areas or in transformational areas in exactly the same way it needs to be treated in other places. Yep. That is for the level of investment, what is the bottom line return? They, um, and, and as we think about that, um, what we have to acknowledge is that most digital transformations have not met the goals uh, of the sponsors or of CEOs. They, and when we say that, uh, there's been just a study in the last, last year, but there were two the year before that said that this, this range of, it not a hit, uh, of not hitting ROI goals is somewhere in the neighborhood of between two thirds and 75% of all transformation efforts. But yeah. Now that's not to say they didn't do anything good. Of course they did, uh, but they didn't hit their ROI goals. Um, and, and what we see about that is this tendency, this fashionista tendency to place the big bets. Uh, and then the other one, even among the conservative, not to be customer focused. Um, there's a very clear link that if you drive customer benefits, and you do that uh, in a way that really makes a difference for it, you will see the, 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 the bottom line change. Now, uh, that actually leads to the, the other part, which is I'll call it, how fast can you get to these things? Um, very honestly, in things like the digital selling shift, um, you can get there damn fast if you're willing to, uh, to go for it, really commit to it. I would say you see companies that are able to get prototypes and pilots of digital selling shift changes up in three months uh, with very clear ROIs, uh, be, uh, you know, scaling things and operational in six months. Mm -hmm. Experience, it's more a matter of quick wins and big moves. Uh, you know, for a, a major insurance company to entirely change all of their claims process uh, is a major undertaking. Uh, but companies that move quickly, now insurance companies have a hard time with that, can get that done in a year, year and a half, but they can get a lot of quick wins in that six month uh, period. Uh, and then I think the pivot is the biggest one. Uh, to say uh, that you're gonna get an ROI from really changing your business uh, model uh, in six months, I don't th think that's realistic. Um, I think what you're talking about are transformations that typically are in the, you know, the two year period, and it depends on the business. Um, for instance, uh, that Adobe case, that kind of famous one that I gave you, um, in the first year, they had negative ROI. And you would have thought that the market would punish them they're a publicly traded company, but they so well communicated what they were up to and why they were doing it, uh, that they didn't. Uh, it took until I think the third quarter of the second year before the ROI went positive, but it's been positive ever since. Thank you, Fred. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, so uh, I think we'd just love to skip ahead to the final one. Here's how we can contact 
uh, Fred and Jorg, thank you both for your time today on this really fascinating topic. And of course, I would encourage you all to check out uh, their book, The Definitive Guide to B2B Digital Transformation. There's a link uh, to their website right uh, in the chat function that you can see. And the book has endorsements from some top executives at Maersk, at Zurich Financial, and Jung, and Jung Heinrich and uh, available now in print and ebook form in Amazon bookstores around the world. Uh, Fred, Jorg, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you all for joining us on this webinar. Uh, please do stay in touch. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Thanks.